which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have touched. The Word of Life. I don't think that anything's a sin if you like sin? it. That's a good one. My own moral belief. My definition of sin is, uh... I'm sinning, yeah. Oh, no comment on sin. My definition of sin is... Wow, this is something I never really thought about. Um, What's your definition of sin? That's a great one. I don't think there is one. My definition of sin is anything that's illegal, immoral, and going against what uh, Christians believe God would have us to do. I would have to say that my definition of sin is probably anything that goes against my moral belief, I would say. Being touched in the wrong way. Anything that's against nature. Living in America. I don't think that anything's a sin if you like it. So. Well, except for murder or hurting somebody, I don't think there is a sin. I think that anything that you enjoy or uh, helps other people, that's got to be good. So Hurting another person. Be something that hurts somebody else. Something that hurts other people. Uh, I guess anything that can go against uh, what you'd read in the Bible, I guess. My definition of sin is like doing something that's not in the Bible. Uh-huh. That's forbidden in the Bible. Pretty sense. much the seven, the seven sins. Lust, um, gluttony, yeah. greed. My definition of sin is ignorance. Anything you feel is wrong, probably is sin. Too much money. Being very, very naughty. My definition of sin would be... Fun. Fun. My definition of sin is anything that goes against the laws of God and man. My definition of sin is, is doing anything against Christ. Anything that's not in the Bible or doing something against that. Doing something against the Ten Commandments, doing something against your fellow man, or breaking the laws of society. A sin to me. Welcome once again to the amazing collection, The Bible for Women, book by book. And today our book is Amos. Recently, I heard a pastor call all of the children in the church up to the front. And he said, children, let me ask you something. Why is it important that we be quiet during a church service? And one bright little girl raises her hand and says, I know because all the people are sleeping. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure that was not the answer the pastor was looking for. Matter of fact, he ended up hearing something he really didn't want to hear. And I don't know if you have ever been there, but I have. I have heard things I didn't want to hear. And some of them were funny, and some of them weren't. 
I've told you all before that I was not raised in a church-going family, but my parents were loving and committed and honorable and moral, and they loved me with a passion that mirrored God's. And yet somewhere in junior high school, I decided to reject all that they held dear. I became very hard and callous and sneaky and self-focused. And despite the fact that time and time again, they would warn me and they would come to me and they would beg me not to do this and they would plead with me to turn away from my rebellion, I wouldn't do it. And my actions and my self-focus and my cruelty, which unfortunately and sadly was aimed primarily at my mother, came to a point of no return. I remember being in college, it was my sophomore year, and I got a letter from home and I opened it up and it started, Dear Margie, you are no longer welcome in this home. No longer welcome. You know why? Because they love me. And they had tried everything they could think of. So they had to draw a line in the sand. They had to exile me. Well, in the book of Amos, that's the same message the prophet has to give Israel. He comes to them and says, you cannot keep cultivating sin without accumulating judgment. And I'm here to tell you that when you do that, judgment is certain. It is. Before we jump into our outline, I want to refer to two charts that will help us get our mind around the book of Amos. The first is the book chart. And there you will see how Amos is the third of the minor prophets. Now, they're not called minor prophets because they're any less important than the major prophets. You already know that. That was just a title given to the smaller books in the late 4th century A.D. to just say, hey, these are shorter. <laughs> and when you're the one reading them, you're mighty glad about it. The other thing I want you to see is the chronological chart. From that, you can see that Amos was really one of the early prophets. He was prophesying during what we studied, that time period of 2 Kings. It was before either nation, either Israel or Judah, had been exiled. And that's pretty important. That's one of the first things we're going to look at. So if you haven't already, please open your book, your Bible to Amos, and open your notebook to Amos. And let's look at division number one. The first thing we're going to look at is Amos's placement in history. Now this is something that makes this book different is when it took place. You see, the book of Amos is set during the time of prosperity for both kingdoms, both Israel and Judah. They were fat and happy. The Dow was up. It was a time of national optimism. One of the commentators said that business was booming and boundaries were bulging. Well, along with those bulging boundaries also came a heightened materialism, immorality, and injustice. Let's refer quickly to the map, just so you can remember how Israel and Judah were divided, since we're going to discuss both of those. The southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, was being ruled by the godly king Uzziah, or your Bibles might say Ezariah. That is the same person. The Bible says that he was crowned at age 16, and he did right in the sight of the Lord. He was a good king. Now, two little things he did wrong. He did not remove the sites of idolatry in the mountains, and he sacrificed in the temple, which was reserved for priests only, and spent the rest of his life with leprosy as a result. Now, the northern king, kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, was being ruled by the capable but evil Jeroboam II. Now, Judah at that time was absolutely economically and militarily sound. They were victorious in everything they did. King Jeroboam reigned for 41 years, and the Bible says he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed in the ways of his father, Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam was not his biological father. He was his spiritual father, and he was an evil father. And you'll remember studying kings that he was the first king of Israel. He was the one that instituted idolatry. 
he set up calf worship in Bethel and Dan. And King Jeroboam II made sure that continued. The last thing, as far as the history is concerned, that I want you to know is it was during this time that Assyria and Babylon were still relatively weak nations. Now, because we've been studying the prophets, you and I know that Assyria and Babylon were used to exile both of these countries. But when Amos is preaching that these two countries are going to come in, it was hard for his audience to believe because they were weak countries at the time. Now, let's look at division number two. This is another thing that makes this book extra special to me. It's what makes it different. And that's who this man Amos was. I think I would have liked him. He just seemed real straightforward, very simple, and clearly lived a very disciplined life. He tells us that he was a herdsman and a tender of the sycamore fruit. Well, these little sheep that he herded, I mean, they were little tiny sheep, but their wool was of an excellent quality. It took great patience to herd little tiny sheep with little tiny legs. That tells you something about Amos right there. And to be a tender of the sycamore fruit was quite a job in itself. That meant fig trees. And as you have studied the nation of Israel, you know that the fig tree to the good Jew was like the screened in porch. That's where he went every morning to read the scriptures, which you can tell is evident in this man's life because though he is a country boy, he is well versed in the scriptures. He repeatedly quotes the Pentateuch. But nonetheless, this was his job. He went to each fruit on the tree and slid it open so the insects could come out and allow the, the fruit to ripen. Can you imagine the patience and the discipline it took to do that? He was not, however, trained to be a prophet or a priest. He's what you and I would call a lay person. But boy, when he got the call, there was no stopping him. Amos was from Tekoa, and that's in the southern kingdom of Judah. Again, looking at the map, you can see that it lies about 12 miles south of Jerusalem, about six miles south of Bethlehem. Most commentators believe these are the same countryside that King David roamed while tending his sheep. Isn't that neat? Grew some godly men there. But the other thing that makes this book's difference is not where Amos is from, but where he went to prophesy. Amos delivered God's message to the people of Bethel, and that was in the northern kingdom of Israel. Again, looking at the map, you'll see how far he had to travel. When he got the call, he went from Tekoa all the way up to Bethel. Now, ladies, that would be a scary place to go, especially for a country boy, because that was the big city. And that was the site where King Jeroboam resided. Why? Because that's where he had set up his idolatrous worship. It would have been very scary, but he goes. And he goes until he delivers all four messages. Let's take a look at the first message. For you, that's division number three. And that is called the pronouncements of judgment. That takes us all the way through chapters one and chapters two. I want to set the scene for you. Our little uh, Judean farmer turned prophet shows up during one of these pagan festivals. That means everybody from the northern kingdom would have been gathered there to celebrate. And it would have been full of what you and I would refer to as lewd and lascivious behavior. And yet he comes in and starts to belt out a prophecy that at first made them Kind of glad. It was a crowd pleaser because Amos gives eight prophecies concerning the eight Palestinian countries surrounding them. And he does it with great passion and great authority. Again, referring to the map, you can see the progression of the countries he begins to name. See, Amos begins with the judgment of the surrounding countries, moving from Syria to Philistia to Phoenicia to Edom to Ammon to Judah. And then he kind of sneaks this one in and he tightens the spiral and says, then the judgment will land on Israel. Well, I can tell you that was not a popular message. Not to these folks who had probably been cheering him up to the point of Judah and then to hear the judgment would fall on them. Now, the way you can find these pronouncements, they're very clear. Amos begins each one with, for these three transgressions, or four. Now he is not giving a numerical equation. 
This is a symbol. It is a symbol. It represents how the sin of these people had reached its full measure. The three or four really helps remind them that God gave you this chance and this chance and this chance and this chance. And you're not listening. He has warned you. He has begged you. He has pleaded with you. He has sent the prophets and you won't listen. And now he's saying he has it up to here. Your sin is over the top. You cannot cultivate sin without accumulating judgment. And that is what God is saying. Then Amos focuses in on their social crimes. That also is a different approach for the prophets. They almost all of them hit the spiritual crimes first, but he doesn't. He hits them with the social crimes because they are a reflection of their empty ritualistic spiritual life. He says, you know, God is the God who cares for the widow and the poor and the orphan. He is the God that cares for the needy. You oppress the needy. You hurt and crush the poor. You take advantage of the widow. God hates man's inhumanity to man. And it's reflecting your spiritual condition. And with great guilt, and these people have great guilt, comes great judgment. And Amos says God is ready to let the hammer down. And he explains the reasons for it in his second message. For you, that is division number four, the promptings of judgment. And that will go all the way through chapter three, four, five, and six. The prompting or the causes for this judgment, I love, again, the, his writing style. It's full of rural images and, and it reflects his knowledge of nature. Um, but he unflinchingly, relentlessly, whips out the judgment. He pictures a holy God and an unholy man. And he does it in a parent-child sort of language. God himself, he quotes him saying, you alone, Israel, in chapter 3, verse 2, you alone have I chosen, have I known. Of all the families in the earth, I chose you. So it is you I shall punish. It is you I shall discipline. And Amos begins each one of these three sermons with, hear this word. He repeats that phrase because he's trying to get their attention. Please hear this. This could be your last chance. In the first sermon, Amos declares Israel's past, present, and future iniquities along with their religious hypocrisy. And that hypocrisy really was the worship of the golden calves. Here they could have worshipped this great God and they settled for these little golden images. And Amos is here to remind them God's not going to allow it anymore. In his second sermon, Amos warns the people of the minor judgments that are about to come. Now God is sending these minor judgments in his mercy because he's hoping it will cause repentance. He's hoping that when they see these things, it'll turn their heart back. But before we jump right into those, if you have your Bible open, I want you to look at chapter 4, verse 1. He does something interesting. Before he starts to list these physical signs, he addresses the women, the women of Israel, the women of privilege. And he does it by calling them cows. <laughs> now, I don't know any woman throughout history that would want to be compared to a cow. At least he picks the best breed of cattle there was at the time. But nonetheless, he says, you fat cows of Bashan, you oppress the poor, you crush the needy. And then you say to your husbands, go get us a drink. They're doing the opposite of what God has asked them to do. He says, help the poor, take care of the needy, respect and honor your husbands. But I can't help but see a parallel between the calves that they worship and the cows they have become. These ladies have become what they worshiped. Now, they may have looked valuable. They may have been successful in the world's eyes. They may have been beautiful and sleek. They may have had all the pleasures they needed. But the truth is, they were as empty 
and hollow and ugly and worthless as those cows they worshipped. Then Amos starts moving into look for these signs. You'll have tons of rain. You'll have no rain. You will have droughts. Your men will be killed by the sword. There will be plagues. There will be caterpillars. Your cattle will be slaughtered and your horses will be taken away. Then there will be darkness and there will be an earthquake. Do you know history, secular history, has recorded that every one of those happened down to two years to the date after he prophesied this. It was June 15th, 763 B.C. An eclipse came, complete darkness came over the land, and it was accompanied with an earthquake. But they don't return. He says, God says three times, I do this, but you still don't return. And he begs them repeatedly, seek me and you will live. But they won't do it. In both of those verses, you know what I could hear? I could hear my parents saying, Margie, just apologize. Admit your mistakes. Repent. If you would show any regret or remorse for your selfish, calloused, arrogant, deceitful ways, we'd take you back, honey. But just like these people, I didn't do it. So Amos has some news for them. And in the third sermon, he says, Israel, your fate is sealed. Severe judgment is decreed. And it's so sad because I think what he was trying to say is God would have relented. And then Amos says to them, you are going to be exiled by Assyria, who remember was a weak country at the time, and you will be exiled with hooks in your face. 722 B.C., Assyria comes into that country and takes the captives away with hooks in their face. Hooks in their face. Amos' third message is one of visions, and these are scary. Amos was called a seer, so he was the kind of prophet that actually watched things unfold before him visually. Amos sees five visions that shows a way that God will judge this callous, adulterous, idolatrous nation of Israel. And these five visions get increasingly more intense and harsh. Now, the first two visions are of locusts and fire. And God uses those to illustrate how fire destroys everything in its path and locusts destroys everything. But Amos who wasn't even an Israelite, intercedes for Israel. So the judgment of locusts and fire are restrained. But then he sees two more visions. Amos explains that through the vision of the plumb line and of the rotting fruit basket, that Israel's imminent judgment is deserved. Now, most people miss this one little tiny narrative. There's only one little tiny narrative in this whole book. And it's an exchange between the high priest of the idolatry of the Bethel worship, calf worship, and Jeroboam and Amos. This high priest, Amaziah, does not like that this Judean is telling them they're going into exile. So he goes and tattles to King Jeroboam. And he comes back and says, the king wants you out of here, Amos. And Amos says, well, I will go when the message is done. And he picks right up where he left off. Now, the rotting fruit, that's pretty self-explanatory. What do you do with rotten fruit? You throw it out. Exactly. And that's what God's saying. I, I got to throw you out. But the plumb line, I want to focus on for one second because most people, when they refer to the book of Amos, they refer to the plumb line. Now, you will read about the plumb line in several of the other prophetical books, but it's associated with Amos. So I brought one with me. You know what a plumb line is. It's a device used to measure the straightness and the strength of a wall. If the builder puts the plumb line up to the wall and it's at all crooked or cockeyed, what's going to happen? The wall's going to crumble. It's going to crash. It's going to fall down. And it will be dangerous. So the builder will tear the wall down to rebuild it. 
Well, if God's law is the plumb line and those people of Israel are the wall, he had no choice but to tear them down and start over. And that's what he's saying when he holds this plumb line up and says, Israel, you don't measure up. You deserve this judgment. Then Amos sees one of the most frightening visions. And if I had been queen, I would have had this vision go with the thought of Amos because it's an entire chapter where he sees great, big, holy God next to the teeny tiny altar of Bethel with this little golden calf on it. If they had the choice, why would they ever pick that to worship? And as God stands there, he says, that's it. Heads will roll. The exile will happen. Judgment is certain. And then it switches to the fourth and final message. And it's one of hope. Now, if you were to compare a ratio between verses on judgment and verses on restoration, and for you all, this is division number six, the promises of judgment, Amos wins hands down more judgment than anything else because this is four verses. It's a very brief but hopeful statement. Amos gives five promises from God for the people's consolation. And every one of them is a picture of Jesus. He is concealed in five different ways that we'll look at. He says that God will reinstate the divinic line. Well, when we get into the New Testament, you will see as we study Matthew 1 and Luke 3, when you follow Jesus Christ's lineage back, it goes back to King David. The divinic line will be established. God will renew the land and never uproot the people again. Most people say that as Amos is describing this, he's giving the picture of the second Eden and the second Adam. Again, Christ concealed. And that this second Eden, this land will be so rich and so abundant they would not be able to harvest all that he will provide. And then lastly, God will restore the people and the cities. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the restorer. When I started to get emotional about my own personal exile, I want to say that it was not because of what my parents did. It's because of what I did. It's because of what I made them have to do. And I believe that's the same thing these people did. And their daddy had to do the same thing because he loved them. And he was going to do anything to bring their heart home, like my parents did. And when I asked my mother's permission to tell the story, she said, you know, honey, I hardly remember it. Because once you did see God, you were restored not only to our family, but to his. Now, I know I am not the only person with an exile story. As a matter of fact, Tracy Green has offered to share her story with us. She is a lovely young woman. And in the world's eye, she had it all together. She's a skinny, fit, personal trainer, aerobics instructor. She was what the world called successful in her image and in her lifestyle and in her pleasure pursuits. But if you were to ask her, I believe she'd say, you know what? I was a fat cow of Bashan. I, was, I am and was what God would call self-indulgent, self-focused, rebellious and empty. And it wasn't until she met God through his son, Jesus Christ, the restorer, that her whole life and story changed. I personally made bad choices, and the choices that I made went anywhere from um, drugs to um, premature sex, all trying to find that love that I knew somehow, somewhere had to be attained. I did join a sorority when I went to school. 
And that to me gave me license to be a social alcoholic, a social drug person. We had a social with another fraternity that we, um, had what they called a pajama social. And I ended up going with several boys to their apartment. And during that time, I went into the restroom and one of those gentlemen, which really wasn't a gentleman, followed me into the bathroom and he raped me. And it was years later that I could talk about it, but even during that time, I felt that I was the one that was at fault. And one, one weekend, that, and I called them like these benders that we would go on, we had all these people over at our place. And I remember the curtains were drawn for over 30 something hours because I kept looking at my watch wondering, where's time going? Where's time going? And then I just saw these people passed out in my den. And I went over and I opened up the window and this light just flooded on me. And I knew there had to be a better way. And I always knew there was a God. I always believed in a God. I just didn't know Him. And I remember saying it as I pulled those curtains open. I said, Lord, God, I know you're there. Help me. Help me. Because at that time, no one knew where I was. So at that time, I vowed in myself that I would never allow someone else to take advantage of me that I would never take drugs again to get myself in a situation where I couldn't control it. So control became my biggest, biggest goal. And I was going to be successful. And I was going to control my destiny at this point on. And so I ended up taking many courses. I ended up working out at the gym. I ended up finding a really neat woman who just took me under her wing. And she uh, managed a health club. And I just taught me the business. And that's what I went after. And I remember thinking to myself that once I achieve this, I will be fulfilled. I um, became anorexic, bulimic, and through those times, I met several different men. I was also pregnant at that time, and I was very scared. And I remember thinking to myself, I have this life in me, but what can I do? I cannot have this child. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm a drug addict. But I knew I couldn't raise a child. And I knew that it wasn't right. And society will tell you that it's not really a baby, that it's not really real, and that I'm not fit. And so I believed that. And I knew that I had to make the alternative choice. So at that time, I chose to abort the child. And then after the procedure, you sit in another room with sad, lonely girls. And how I know this so well is because it didn't happen just one time in my life. I made that decision several times. And that's knowing that I had, and each time that I had that precious life in me that no one said was a precious life. And I just asked God to, to show me a way. And I go to the gym. And one of my clients just happened to be um, a wonderful Christian lady, and her name was uh, Janie Elo. And I'm with her, and she said, well, Tracy, do you pray? And I said, you know, I pray to God all the time. God, I need a new car. God, where should I live? God, give me some great clients. She said, well, Tracy, do you, do you ever, you know, pray to Jesus? And I looked straight at her. I said, what do you mean you pray to Jesus? I grabbed her hand. I said, I have to know what you're talking about. Well, she immediately, oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, okay, listen, if you ever want to know about this, just let me know, and we'll have a talk about Jesus because, you know, He is your Lord, and you have to pray to Him because if you don't pray to Him, and she just said this whole idea about how Jesus was God, and that, that's who you pray to, that He is your Lord. And I had never heard that before, so I took her hand. I said, this is the day I have to learn about this. And we went into the aerobics room, and we sat there, and I held her hand, and I just prayed that God would, number one, forgive me, which is my story and that He would come into my life and to fill that void that I was so desperate for. And the interesting thing to understand is I had finally found the love that I was so desperately seeking. 
Well, like in the book of Amos, where Amos talks about judgment on his people, God is also the God of second chances, and he woos us, and he continues to woo us, and he woos us through people, but he woos us through his creation.